South Africa city volunteers traveled to Malawi to help the cyclone-affected residents rebuild homes. We look back at city's first disaster relief mission in Cambodia 25 years ago. Welcome to Dai Headlines, I'm Siri Su, thank you for joining us. Cyclone Idai has devastated Malawi, affecting more than 40,000 people in Blantyre. South Africa city volunteers have traveled there to assess the damages. The volunteers will work with the affected residents to rebuild their homes. This is Malawi, a country in southeastern Africa. We're currently in their biggest city, Blantyre. According to the United Nations statistics, Cyclone Idai has devastated more than 40,000 people in Blantyre, mostly in Chingobi. Chingobi has hills, therefore when the heavy rains came, the water flowed down. It did not cause floods or landslides, but it damaged the residents' houses. <laughs> More than a month after Cyclone Idai struck, the road conditions are still poor, but they're no longer muddy. In Chingobi, the houses are still collapsed. Even some residents are staying in partially collapsed houses. The house is built with mud and water, so it is not secure enough. When heavy rains come, the houses are easily damaged. Due to poverty, the residents could only build simple houses. However, when heavy rains come, the houses are easily damaged. In the aftermath of Cyclone Idai, more than 120 houses in Chingobi have collapsed. Therefore, city volunteers have come to the disaster area. We arrived in Malawi on March 16th. On the second day, we started taking actions. We had to buy building materials and hold meetings at the community center. The tribal chief would tell all of the tribal volunteers ways to work as a team to rebuild their homes. Everyone is participating. By inviting the affected residents to rebuild their houses, the volunteers hope to calm their minds as well as provide them with permanent homes. So the volunteers will continue to accompany the affected residents and they plan to build 70 Dai houses. One month after Cyclone Idai devastated Mozambique, we'll take you to visit eight-year-old Rosinha. She and her family took shelter in Bera when the floods submerged their village. When the floods receded, she took out her wet textbooks and laid them on the ground to dry. Here, here, here. They were living there. And she was driving, she was drying the books there. When Dino Foy went to investigate disaster areas, he found this young girl sitting alone under the sun. Look here, and that's where me and her we sat to dry our books. The scene touches Dino Foy deeply because this girl is the same age as his daughter. So when I looked at Zinga, I saw my daughter. You know, I, I'm not a normal, very emotional person, but uh, I think that it has been more than 20 years that I don't cry. I cried because of Zinga, you know, uh, because we normal are worried with uh, cold water, with the air condition, or uh, Gucci trousers, but Zinga only wanted our books to be dry, only. Who will bring textbooks while fleeing for their life? Rosinha's father says she would because they are the only things she owns. I know she loves reading books, although everyone was quite fearful on that day. She was brave to bring her textbooks along. When she saw the sun come out, she immediately remembered to take the textbooks out to dry them. I spread out a straw sheet and put the books on it to dry them. When I was staying in the shelter, the books weren't all dry, but I felt I had to dry them quickly so I could read them. A family of six stayed for a week in the shelter. Two weeks ago, they finally rented a small room in the city's shanty town. They spread out store sheets on the ground and slept on it. Feeling sorry for the family, Dino Foy brought them three portable folding beds and told them to lay down city blankets on the beds first. The adults cannot stand up straight in this room, which does not have water or electricity. The, the three city bags that I gave to them, 
uh, the two is for the children and the couple sleeps here because there is no enough space for the third bed. The blanket is good, but uh, at the end of the day, it might not be really useful because it's very hot, as you can feel it. The father only hopes that the whole family is together, and Rosinha only wants her textbooks to be dry. Volunteer Dina Foy also gives her a new school bag and uniform, and also wishes she could return to school quickly. Tomorrow we'll start going to school. International disasters have struck one after another, requiring immediate support and compassion. Recently at the City Humanitarian Culture Center, staff came together to host a charity event. This table is full of goods which are either new or second-hand. They've all been donated by volunteers. Even well-known stationery and ceramic products from southern Taiwan joined the charity bazaar. Supporters from across Taiwan pitched in to help. This is from the Bodhisattva in central Taiwan. This person gave these personal hygiene products. And this is from the south, a driver for our news department who makes his own enzyme cleaning products. You bought it. Thank you. Yes, we're selling this. In the middle of this interview, these secondhand bags suddenly became popular. It's from Tang Meiyun. It's charming, not easy to get such a thing. <laughs> the goods offered by well-known Tang Meiyun attracted a crowd throughout the event. I must say that our colleagues are very sincere and committed. This is our anchor Fang Yu who worked at 2 o'clock in the evening and then went home and made this. This is all what our colleagues made. These handmade chocolate snacks were also made after work in until 1 a.m. These traditional snacks include green bean soup, which was also sold at the event. This recipe comes from Hengchun, Sister Guo Lingdui's secret recipe. She taught us how to make it and it is only available today. The charity bazaar was held over lunchtime. Guests were able to savor these items directly, filling their stomachs and their hearts. I feel that there is a lot of food to eat. My mother also bought a lot, so I'm looking forward to coming home and eating these things. We responded to this international disaster relief through this act of love. Many came forward to share their love and compassion, and most importantly, their blessings for people who are suffering from disaster far away. In Malaysia, the kindergarten in Kita held a parent-child cooking contest. The event allowed the parents to spend some quality time with their children. I'm Dan Huiying, the special reporter at the cooking contest. We have five teams of parents and children. Let's visit them. I want to cook potatoes, carrots, and romaine lettuce with mommy. The ingredients we have prepared are potatoes, cauliflowers, and mugwurst. We are making a cauliflower croquette. The food stuff seems simple, but this team can turn them into delicious homemade dishes. I didn't know how to cook fried rice, so I watched a YouTube video. We use mushrooms, carrots, lettuce, and lima beans because we want to make it colorful. When he sees the colors, he wants to cook it, so we use this to make him cook the fried rice. She suggested that she could make fruit salad because she learned how to make salad at school. Why we joined this contest is because we want to have the chance to take part with Eaton. It's the process we want to enjoy. Every dish is as tasty and colorful as any other dishes, and they were made to remind people to love the Mother Earth.
Taichung Floral Expo is near the end of its exhibition. During this time, there are many devoted volunteers serving at the humanitarian and ecotech pavilion. This is the amount of water of one chopstick. The water flows out in this amount. We can still wash our hands clean. Patiently explaining the concept again, GG volunteer Ding Zhengshen is not tired of teaching visitors on how to save water. The more visitors we have, I will feel more relaxed while explaining it, and it's more interesting too. This brings me a sense of accomplishment. Yan Xinzhen works at the Environmental Protection Bureau. He also comes to volunteer during the weekends. If I go out, I'll be having fun, and when I'm at home, I'll be watching TV. So coming here to volunteer on weekends makes me feel meaningful. Over two-thirds of the volunteers at the Ecotech Pavilion are seniors in their 60s or 70s. When you volunteer mindfully, you won't feel tired at all. I saw many grandpas, grandmas, uncles and aunties dedicating themselves for the environment. We must also do something for the environment. These volunteers like to interact with their visitors and never ask anything in return for their hard work because they want more people to take actions to protect our environment. In China, Dongguan City volunteers have been promoting recycling in the local communities. Recently, a recycling station was established in Tangxia. This is the opening ceremony of the recycling station in Tangxia town of Dongguan Prefecture. It's also a big step for the volunteers as they have been promoting recycling in the area. This is probably the first recycling station in Tangxia. We can start from here and then extend it to other communities. So I'm very glad that Ziji can come here and invite us to do recycling. After the establishment of Ziji Recycling Point, the residents want to learn how to implement recycling in their daily lives. Normally, we don't store our garbage at home. Today, I've learned a lot about recycling. After going back home, we will start sorting the recyclables. This is the first time for volunteers to promote the recycling concepts in the community. They have carried out various activities for the residents. After participating in today's event, I've realized how important it is to do recycling. Some of the recyclable goods can be reused for several times. From now on, we can let our children sort the items by themselves, and we will bring the recyclables to the recycling station. In addition, we will start to reuse things instead of throwing them away. Protecting the planet is every person's responsibilities. We must work together to make our world a cleaner and a better place. In 1994, when the rainy season came in Cambodia, floods affected more than 1.3 million people. Faced with no food, local governments appealed to Taiwanese businessmen, who in turn appealed to the city foundation for help. The road was bumpy and the car swayed. Looking out the window at the endless countryside only slightly relieved the symptoms of car sickness. The trip from Phnom Penh along Highway 2 took us four hours to reach our destination at Takeo province. In 1994, this trip would take almost eight hours. At the time, it was all red clay and potholes. Going back in time nearly a quarter of a century, the scene you are seeing shows that development has stagnated, far from the capital of Cambodia. In fact, nearly all of the disaster relief 25 years ago had to come by boat on this blue highway. In the rainy season, four or five meters on both sides of the river bank are flooded. 25 years ago, Ziji came by boat and set up a temporary wooden plank road to allow more than 200 families to come ashore. This dirt road was also built just a few years ago. It was recently used for a distribution site.
Taiwan Tsuji Foundation came here to send rice. They did it right here. At that time, Tsuji gave each person 50 kilograms of rice. If there are five people in my family, I will get 250 kilograms of rice. Heavy bags of rice are carried on shoulders. After the rainy season, villagers are warned by this relief aid, which makes them quite happy. The materials we bring today are not much, but the concern, compassion, and blessings that we bring to all of you is infinite and unlimited. At that time, December 8, 1994, residents are short of food because they were flooded, so there is no way to find something to eat. There was no road at the time, and then the rainy season came. There is no way to farm, so at that time, Taiwan City came to help residents, providing about two to three months of food. <laughs> Working around a chaotic political situation to bring long-lasting love and a lifeline to these affected people helps them during their time of need, giving them much-needed rice. In Malaysia, the Tsuji Moor branch held a lecture on happiness in life. It invited a Taiwan Tsuji volunteer as the keynote speaker. She talked about how to use love to resolve the friction between her husband and children. I wanted to learn why there was so much hate. Besides gambling money, he loved to scold people and always cursed our children. Once she totally resented her husband, but now she has laid this to rest. Featured in the Dai drama A Tsai, Taiwan Zhiji volunteer Ding Ling Tsai was invited to give a speech at the Zhiji Moor branch about how to use her love to resolve setbacks in life. As a mother, not being sad will be deceiving my children. Volunteer Yi Lei Bi came with her daughter and tried to learn from the lecture. Listening to the lecture, we have to do more to change ourselves. We should use love in our education. We should not lose our temper again and should communicate with our children. People are not perfect. We also need to make adjustments. In my life, there may be twists and turns and maybe younger brother is teaching us something about our heart. The sharing of volunteers' life experiences has brought a more positive impact and power to local people. In Malaysia, Tsuji Kuala Lumpur and Selengko chapter has been caring for refugees. In September 2018, they have applied for three-year appropriation from the American government. After receiving the financial assistance, Tima started to conduct free clinics for the refugees. In Malaysia, Tima and Tsuji volunteers have conducted a free clinic at the Continuing Education Center Puchong to safeguard the health of refugees. We found out there are many refugees in Klang Valley. There are around 60,000 to 100,000 refugees in this area. In general, they have poor living conditions and they don't have a stable job. Volunteers help the refugees to get to the venue, allowing those who have mobility issues to receive medical treatment. I have a stomach ache and I couldn't go out to seek medical attention because I don't have an identification card. By coming here today, I felt very relieved. I've been enduring the pain for a while and I can finally receive the treatment. Many of them could not receive basic health services, so for them this free clinic is very important. Fortunately, Tsuji has been conducting free clinic events, letting refugees have access to health care. I'm sick. I have a cough and a fever. Tima doctors helped me and gave me medication. 
The refugees suffered from illnesses and diseases due to poverty. Therefore, they could not afford medical treatment. I think this is a very severe situation. This is why we are here to treat these refugees, providing them with medical services. At the venue, there are 22 medical staff serving more than 200 refugees. Besides promoting health care, doctors and volunteers also wanted to improve the medical services for this population. In Malaysia, a foreign spouse from Myanmar has been diagnosed with kidney disease in 2018. Since then, she had to undergo dialysis and face large medical fees. Fortunately, city volunteers reached out. <laughs> Going outside before daybreak, Grace Yen has to undergo treatment at the dialysis center three days a week. Being independent, she once resisted undergoing dialysis. When I first started undergoing dialysis here, I was unhappy, especially when I was at the hospital. I complained that I was the one falling ill. Why me? I don't want to fall ill. I kept asking myself, why was I the one facing this illness? 38-year-old Grace Yen is a foreign spouse from Myanmar. In 2018, she was diagnosed with kidney failure. Another dialysis patient's words made an impact on her. She told me, in fact, you should be grateful. Fortunately, you are ill, but not suffering from cancer. With kidney problems, we can live on with dialysis treatment. If we were suffering from cancer, even if we have money or abilities, we might not be able to live. Her words really encouraged me. Expensive dialysis treatment became a burden for Grace Yan's family. Her husband's monthly income is only enough to support the family. Fortunately, Tsuji's financial assistance lessened the family's burden. Tsuji has helped us a lot, so I do not have to bear the financial burden. Dialysis can cost up to 1,000 U.S. dollars. We cannot afford it. We did not know what to do. Fortunately, Tsuji helped us out. I keep comforting her, even when I did not go visit her. I will call her from time to time to ask her about her conditions. After all, she has fallen ill and she is not a local resident. Coming from Myanmar, she might not have relatives or friends here. Therefore, I thought since I'm in charge of this case, I should care for her, treating her like a family member. Then she wants to reciprocate the help. I can tell she's very grateful. Three months after I contacted her, she kept asking what she can do to pay back the help. She wants to help other people. Treating her like a family member, the volunteers even refer Gracie to work. I can still do easy work, such as cleaning. We don't clean for a long time, just more than an hour. Grace Yen has a wish. She hopes that she can eventually support herself and even help other less fortunate people. Therefore, I'm very grateful. If one day I can pay for my own dialysis treatment or if my husband gets more work, I can stop relying on other people. Getting the help when you need it the most, you will never forget that. Some kindergartners in New Taipei City visited its Suji recycling station and got hands-on experience on sorting recyclables. We'll leave you with these images. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye.